Well, we all know that feeling. And you know, it's generally caused through lack of maintenance. Like many people, because of the cost involved in vehicle maintenance, over the years I've attempted various servicing procedures. But unfortunately I've found it quite confusing trying to follow a printed workshop manual. So with the aid of Ron, our mechanic, we've developed this tape to enable the amateur, using standard tools and equipment, to competently service his or her own vehicle. Our tape will take you visually, step by step, through the standard servicing procedures, just as if you had a mechanic at home helping you. There may be slight variations between vehicle makes and models. For example, you may have four or six cylinders, or different positions of the oil filter or fuel filter. But this should in no way interfere with the service you're about to perform, as the basic principles are the same. By using the specification sheet in your driver's handbook, you can ascertain the various point and plug gaps for your particular vehicle. If you've lost or misplaced your handbook, ask your local dealer for the specifications. If not, write to us with your make, year and model and we'll send you the appropriate information. Most importantly, remember that safety is paramount, so if in any doubt at all, contact a specialist. Now let's go over the workshop and see Ron. As we're about to start the service, we'll just run through the basic tools we'll need to carry it out, and also we'll have a look at the parts that we'll require. And the equipment on this side of the table can be purchased quite cheaply at any department store, but we'll go into that in more detail as we go through the service. These are the general tools that you'll have at home anyway. Spanners, screwdrivers, a set of feeler gauges, pliers, wire brush, and an adjustable spanner. You'll find that most people own these things so there's no need to go out and buy anything specific to do the service with. To actually carry out the service you'll need the spare parts like oil filter, distilled water, air filter, brake shoes etc. Before you start your service just get yourself a piece of old rag that you can put over the mud guard to save any scratches or spills of oil going on it while you're doing the service. Let us first check a major cause of breakdowns, the battery. Ascertain what type of battery you have. This one is a conventional battery. If it was a maintenance free battery, you would not have the filler plugs on the top. Now batteries can be lethal. They give off hydrogen gas, which is highly explosive, and the electrolyte is corrosive, so be very careful when dealing with them. If there's any corrosion present, as in this case, hot water will get it off. I'll just demonstrate that. As you can see, this is a conventional battery. We have the filler plugs on the top. There's a high and a low mark. You must make sure that the electrolyte lays between the high and the low mark, as you can see in this one it does. Some batteries don't have a translucent case you can see through. In these cases, take off the cap and just check inside and make sure the electrolyte level is about 10 millimetres above the plates. And remember, always use distilled water to top up the battery. The last thing to do on the battery is remove the battery terminals. Get a piece of emery cloth and just clean any corrosion or dull looking marks off. Do exactly the same to the terminal itself. Just wipe them off. Then to save any corrosion starting again, just get a smear of petroleum jelly and put round each one. Terminal can be put back on. And then just nipped up with a spanner. Don't do them too tight, as you'll find that there'll be a devil to get off next time. Do the same with the other terminal. Now your battery is serviced. The cooling system. Now remember, never ever 
take the radiator cap off when the engine is hot. You could be very badly scalded. If you have an expansion bottle fitted in your car, you'll be able to check whether there's enough coolant in just by looking on the expansion bottle. This one hasn't got an expansion bottle, so we're going to have to look underneath the cap just to check to see if the coolant level is high enough. Look into the filler neck. Uh, the coolant level should be approximately or a centimetre below the lip in the top of the actual radiator. Um, if it's lower than that, top it up. Remember, never fill it above a centimetre from the top of the radiator because you'll find that thermal expansion will just push the excess out of the overflow pipe anyway. Only use distilled water because the tap water isn't really suitable for topping up the radiators with. Don't forget to make sure you add corrosion inhibitor to the water. Another little tip to remember, when you put the cap back on, put a smear of petroleum jelly on the two ceiling surfaces. You'll find that way that the next time you want to take the radiator cap off, it will come off nice and easy. Check all the hoses for pliability. Any hose which is hard and brittle or soft and mushy should be replaced with a new one. Check all the hose clamps at the same time. If there's any evidence of any leakage around the clamps, any weepage of coolant, just lightly lubricate the clamp with a proprietary brand of spray lubrication and just tighten it up. Now don't forget at the same time to check the heater hoses and the clamps on the heater hoses. Another cause of overheating can be found in the thermostat. The thermostat is at the end of the top radiator hose on the engine end. It's quite a simple thing to change. Undo the bolts that hold the thermostat housing on, take the thermostat out and put a new one in. Just bolt the thing back down with a new gasket, fill it up with coolant and your problem should be over. Let's see how a brake system works. When the brake pedal is pushed, piston A causes hydraulic pressure in line B, which in turn causes piston C to expand the brakes. On the left is a disc brake and on the right a drum brake. This is the basic principle of all systems. Let's now check the brake master cylinder and booster unit. This is the brake master cylinder. And this is the booster unit. To check the brake fluid level, you can either check through the, through the fluid reservoir and make sure that the fluid level is between the high and the low marks, or the method I always use, take the cap off and just check that you've got fluid up to the maximum level mark. Be very careful when you take the cap off because this is a very efficient paint stripper. And if you get any on the paintwork of the car, you'll find that you'll lose the paint in that area. While you're in this area, make sure there's no weepage around any of the pipes that come off of the master cylinder. If there is, just get a spanner and just nip up the connections that might be leaking slightly. Whilst we're here, we'll also check the brake booster. Now, the brake booster works, it helps by decreasing the pedal effort required to drop stop the car. There's only one real thing you can check on this, that's the non-return valve from the vacuum on the inlet manifold. The easiest way to do that, undo these two clamps, take the valve out and make sure that it will only pass air one way. So if you blow this way, air will pass through. If you blow this way, air won't pass through. If it does that, it's okay. If you can get air to go through both ways, then you need a new valve. Now let's check the front and the rear brakes. When you've jacked up the car, make sure you use axle stands. Never attempt to work under a car supported by a jack alone. Don't forget, before you put the vehicle up on the stands, just loosen the wheel nuts off about three quarters of a turn. That way you'll find it easy to spin the nuts off when you get the vehicle up.
Now this is the disc brake housing. You'll remember that from our schematic at the beginning. Here's a new brake pad. As you can see, there's a small step at the end. When the brake pads wear down to that step, it's time to change them. So let's just take this caliper off and check the pads that are already in there. Now to remove the caliper on this car to get at the brake pads, you undo this pinch bolt at the bottom. Just take it right out, put it to one side. And then the caliper will swing up and out of the way. So to get it to stay up, just take a piece of wire and attach it to a convenient part of the chassis. Pull it up and wrap it around the caliper so that the caliper doesn't fall down on your fingers. And there are the pads. As you can see, there's quite a fair bit of wear in there. So just take one right out so we can check it. There's still a slight amount of wear left in there. It's not down to the telltale step. But because they're so close, we'll change them while we've got them out. The shim on the back of it is purely to stop the pad squeaking when you apply the brake. Put the new pads in, they're pushed into the top housing first, pushed up hard into the slot at the bottom. The same goes for the other side. Sometimes they're a little bit tight, right, they're clipped in, and the anti squeal spring just clips on the back, like thus. But that won't stay on there until we start to put the caliper down. Now obviously, because the pads we had in this brake were worn, the distance between the piston and the outside of the caliper is going to be smaller than the distance with the new pads in. So we've got to then retract the piston back into the housing. Now you'll find this easiest to do with just a lever of some description. Just place it in the side, push down and you can see the piston going back into the housing. Just push it right down until it's all the way home. When it's right in, take the wire off. Just slip it down, make sure it will fit over the shoes. Now we've got the caliper right down. Take the securing bolt. Screw it back in. And these don't have to be done up extremely tightly, but they have to be pretty firm. So put it in. And just nip it up to make sure the caliper won't fall off. Now obviously once we've put new pads in, and retracted the piston as far as it'll go, we've got to somehow take the clearance up that exists between the new pads and the caliper piston. So when you've done both sides of the car, get in and push the pedal, the brake pedal down two or three times, and that'll take all the clearance up, um, and you'll have no problems with the pedal going to the floor. All disc brakes, you'll find are self-adjusting now, so there shouldn't be any problems if you carry out that procedure. While we're on the... Uh braking system, check out all the hoses, the flexible hoses, make sure there's no cracks and that there's no weeps or anything around where they bolt on. One important point to remember, when the piston is pushed back into the caliper housing, the fluid that had pushed it out must go somewhere. Some people will open the bleed screw, that's this screw here, and the fluid will come out of there while they're pushing it back. I prefer to push the cylinder back and let it all go into the master cylinder. From there you can just bait it out with a, a teaspoon or anything that's handy. Well, that's the front brakes finished. The only thing left to do now is put the wheels back on. So the, we're at the rear of the car now. As you can see, the wheel's already been removed. To get to the brake shoes, we have to take the complete drum off of this particular model, prise the grease cap from the centre of the wheel, 
is a small split pin. Straighten the split pin tang out and remove the split pin, split pin completely. Take off the locking washer and then with a suitable spanner undo this, the nut in the centre. I mean, this won't be very tight because these are tapered roller bearings and they need adjusting. Spin the nut right off. You just rock the hub. So be careful when you pull it off that you make sure the bearings don't fall out of the hub. This is the rear brake system. As you can see, this one hasn't been looked at for a long, long while. You can tell by the dust, etc., that's in it. Now we'll set about changing the shoes. Before we actually start work changing these shoes, we'll clean some of the dust out of the brake. Now be very careful when you're cleaning these off. And obviously any foreign substance being breathed in can be no good. So just make sure that you don't breathe big mouthfuls of this stuff in. As you can see, the brake shoes on this car are very, very badly worn. They're nearly down to the metal on the backing plate. This is the thickness they should be. That's the thickness they are. But before we get around to actually taking the shoes off and changing them, we'll just briefly run over the system as it is on the car. This is the brake slave cylinder. As you can remember from the schematic, inside there's two pistons which push out and push the brake shoes out onto the drum. These are the brake shoes, and this is the return spring. On some cars, the return spring would just be a coil spring from one side to the other. These little screw, these little springs here, just stop the shoes from scraping and rattling about. This is part of the self-adjusting system. Now, what I suggest before you jump in and pull the brake shoes off, do what I always do. Get a piece of paper and make a diagram of this whole assembly exactly where it goes. And you'll find when you put it back together, you'll have no problems at all. Right, now let's take the brake shoes off the car. First thing to do is to remove the return spring. This is held by a clip at the bottom. So we'll just lever that clip off, place it to one side. And the return spring is then pulled up and out. As you can see, the shoes are still held in place by the anti-rattle springs. So the next thing we'll do is take off those springs. Get a pair of pliers and just hold the cap. And if you feel around the back of the brake plate, you'll feel the head of the actual pin that goes through the middle. Hold the head and just turn the pin. And the anti-rattle spring will come off. When you've got this far, this shoe can be eased out. The retaining spring at the bottom can be taken off. That's one shoe completely finished. That's the easy side. Now we come onto the side with the self-adjusting mechanism on. Take off the self-adjuster. Take off the anti-rattle spring. And this shoe can then be lifted away. Now on the back of the shoe, you can see the handbrake cable fixes into the self-adjusting mechanism. It's just a matter of easing the spring back and pulling out the handbrake cable. Now, the next thing to do is move this, the self-adjusting linkage. This is held on by a, a clip, which must be prized off of this pivot point. They can be a bit tight, so just wriggle it back and forward until you can get a screwdriver underneath it and ease it off. Take off the wave washer, and then just ease the peg out. At the same time, unclip in the spring. Right, make sure that you've got your new shoe close to hand when you take the linkage off, so that you can put it straight on without losing sight of where all the different bits and pieces go. Clip the spring over with the pliers so that it goes in the retaining hole. And then all it means then is just putting back 
the spring clip. The wire washer goes on, the spring clip goes over, and is pushed on by a pair of pliers. When you get the washer right on, just make sure you crimp the ends together, like so. That's the self-adjusting linkage back on the shoe. And now we'll just hook the brake cable back in and offer that up into position. Now this can be held up in place by the anti-rattle springs. Remember we took them off in the first place with a pair of pliers? Place one of the washers on with the beveled section outwards. Spring goes on next. And the last one, just get a pair of pliers so you can push it on and turn it onto the actual pin. That'll hold the brake shoe in place as you can see. And the next shoe we'll put on the same put on the brake pivot retaining spring, which hooks on the bottom of the brake shoe just there. Then we can start to put the rest of the shoes together. And this is the brake adjuster. As you can see, it's wound out because the other brake shoes were so badly worn. We must remember to wind that back in, otherwise we'll never get the drum on when we, put the new, when we finish putting the new shoes on. So wind it in as far as it'll go. Slip it in the place it's supposed to go. If you check your diagram you'll see that uh, all this will be perfectly straightforward. Clip the holding down spring into the other brake shoe. If you can do it. Line everything up and push the shoe home. Now the only thing left to do is put in the anti-rattle spring which will hold everything in place until you put the final return spring in. Remember, put the little washer in with the concave section outwards first, then the spring, and the last one with a pair of pliers, just holding it very firmly, push it down and turn it so it holds the shoe in place. And the last thing to put on is the return spring and the return spring clip. Hook it into one side and pull it over firmly. Make sure it's firmly home. And that clip holds the, the bottom of the return spring in. So it hooks underneath the shoe. Sometimes they're very tight, you may have to use a screwdriver just to push it on. That back there. We've completed putting the new brake shoes on. Next thing we'll do is we'll take the rear brake drum, remove the bearings, clean them off and make sure they're okay, re-grease them and put the wheel back on. So now we'll take the wheel bearings out, take the oil seal out and clean and re-grease them. Check them, of course, to make sure that there's no cracks or pits in the bearings themselves. Remember, this is the, the brake hub with the locking washer. Just put them in a, a container, any container will do, an ice cream container or an old saucepan. It's the outer wheel bearing. You can turn the drum over. Get a screwdriver and lever the oil seal out, and we'll replace that with a new one, and take out the inner bearing. Make sure that you clean all the dust out of the brake drum itself. And while you're doing that, just check and make sure that there's no really heavy or excessive scoring of the inside of the drum. If there is, you'll have to get it specially machined to fit the new shoes into. As soon as that's You've got all the dust out. That can be placed to one side, ready for the next operation. Get the bearings, clean them in some degreaser. 
This will take all of the old grease that's in there out. And you should then be able to check and see whether the bearings have got any anything wrong with them at all. Don't uh, scrimp on cleaning these things out. Get rid of all the old grease if you possibly can. When you've cleaned all the bearings out, just check each individual roller. Run your finger down, make sure there's no tracks or lines in it. And just go over each one to make sure there's no tips. Do this right round the bearing. That's both the inner bearing and the outer bearing. And just make sure there's no marks on them at all. And when that's been done, check the outer track of the bearing. As you can see, the bearing sits in like that. So we want to make sure that the outer track is in very good condition as well. Make sure there's no pits or lines in it. As long as they're both okay, then we can get go on with the next step, which is repacking the bearings with grease. Once you've made sure that there's no blemishes or pits on the rollers on this particular track, and there's no, nothing on the outer track, and everything's clean, you've degreased the inside of the hub, you've degreased the bearing, then is the time to get fresh grease, uh, a high melting point bearing grease is the ideal thing and just make sure you put it right through the bearing. When you get the grease, don't be afraid to push it well into the bearing. It's better to have too much than too little. And make sure that it goes right in between the rollers. Do it all the way around. And check both sides to make sure that it is going into the bearing really well. And then, once that's well packed, Go down to the hub, and on the bearing track in the hub, put a good layer of grease on there too. So all the way around. And drop the bearing in the hole. Just give it a little turn just to make sure that it's seated properly. Now we can refit the inner oil seal. This stops the grease going onto the brake shoes. Just place it in the space provided. Just tap it down until it's flush all the way around. And you can turn the hub over and do the same with the other bearing. When the bearing is nicely covered with grease, just take some extra grease. And if you look down the center of the hub, you'll see a well just past the bearings. Just make sure you pack that well with the grease inside there, because that's the sort of reservoir. If you don't put enough grease in there, you'll find that it'll fling the bit grease out of the bearings and the bearings will run dry. Stick the bearing in, give it a turn. It's now the wheel's ready to go back on. We've fitted the new brake shoes. Just have a quick check to make sure everything's in the right position. We've cleaned the stub axle to get all the old grease and dirt off. Now we can replace the hub. Offer the hub up. If it doesn't go on at first, you may find that you may just have to tap the shoes up or down just to centralise them so you can, the hub will slide on properly. When the hub's fully home, put on the in the outer bearing. The lock washer. And the nut. We just do the nut up finger tight to start with. Just run the wheel round. Get a hold of the top and the bottom and rock it from side to side. See if there's any play. Spanner, lift it up a bit tighter, and then come back about half a flat. When I say half a flat, that's half of the distance from that one to that one there, which is oh, perhaps an eighth of a turn. When you're there, put on the locking washer, 
Now these things you can turn them round until you get it to sit exactly in the space that the split tin will go in. Put a split tin in. When the split tin's through, just tap it down and bend the tang up just to make sure it's not going to come out. And when you put the cap back on, make sure you pack it with some fresh grease. This again acts like a, a reservoir for the bearings. Put it in position. And just tap it back home gently. Make sure it's in all the way around. That completes your brake service. We've just done the service on a front wheel drive car, which means we repack the bearings in the rear wheel. For people with rear wheel drive cars, you'll find that you'll repack the bearings in the front wheel. We're now going to change the engine oil, which is contained in the sump. But before we change the oil, it's a good idea to go for a run, about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour in the car, just to make sure it's nice and warm. And be certain that you have something to catch the engine oil in. I find a plastic washing up bowl is the ideal thing. Just place it under the sump, get a spanner onto the sump plug, and loosen the plug. Undo the drain plug. When you take it out, be very careful because the oil will obviously be hot after your run to warm it up. And get your hand out of the way of the plug quickly so the hot oil doesn't go all over you. Right, just leave that draining and then you can get up and take the oil filter off of the side of the engine block. This is the new filter we're going to put on. Now to remove this filter, we'll need a filter removing tool. Something like this. It fits over the filter and just by tightening it up on it we can turn the filter off of the side of the engine block. Now on this particular car, the filter is in, at the back of the block underneath the inlet manifold. If we look right down the back of the engine, we can see it. Once you've uh, uh, slackened the filter off with the filter removing tool, the filter can be spun off by hand. But be very careful when you've nearly got it off because it's full of oil. So try and tilt the filter upright as quick as possible. You've left the drain tray underneath the engine just to make sure that it does catch any oil that leaks out. And we've undone the filter now, we just pull it out from the back of the body. Take care to keep the filter this way up. Uh, it's still got some oil in it. If you tip it up the other way, you'll find it'll go all over the floor. And I always use the box the new filter came in. Just pop it in that, it'll keep it upright for you. Before you put the new filter in, just around the ceiling ring at the top, make sure you put a smear of grease. You'll find that when you screw it on the engine block, this will make it go on a lot easier and it won't tear the rubber ceiling ring up. The only thing left to do now is get a piece of rag and just wipe on the face of the block where the filter goes. Make sure it's clean and drop the filter down and just screw it on. And when you screw it up, spin it up until it goes against the block and then just do it up about a quarter of a turn and that's plenty tight enough. That's the oil filter fitted. The next thing we must do is put the drain plug back in. Just make sure that you clean the surface of the drain plug that actually goes into the sump and the thread. And also clean underneath the sump as well where it screws on to save getting any dirt into the new oil you're going to put into the engine. We've replaced the sump plug. Now before we start to top the engine up with oil, we'll clean around the filler cap. Make sure there's no dirt which can get into the engine once you lift the cap off. Now you need a funnel it's very difficult to tip oil in straight from the container. And when you top it up with oil, make sure you buy good quality oil. It's really false economy to use cheap oil. It very gently does it to start with. And just be careful when you're pouring the oil in that you don't tip it in too fast because it can sometimes flow out over the top of the rocker cover. Make sure you frequently check the level against the dipstick as well. 
wipe the dipstick once, dip it in, take it out, just hold it and you'll see. We're just right on the mark there. And what we must remember is that the filter is empty and all the oil passages in the engine are empty. So we'll have to run the engine now for a few seconds just to pump the oil around and we'll check the level again and top it up to the required mark. Now we're going to start the engine. Just let the engine run for 20 or 30 seconds just to make sure that the oil fills up the filter and fills up all the oil passages. And while we're here, we'll just check where we screwed the filter onto the block just to make sure it's not leaking at all. No, everything seems to be fine, so we'll turn the engine off now, dip the oil, and you can see how it's gone down. Right, as you can see, we started off on the high mark, now the oil's dropped down nearly to the low mark. That's because we filled the oil filter up. Now we've just got to top it up with that required amount to bring it up to the full mark again. Just remember to be careful when you tip it in, you don't tip it in too fast. Well, I don't think the small amount we're putting in at the moment is going to make that much difference. We could probably put that in as quick as we want to. Again, frequent checks, just to make sure you don't overfill. Right, as we can see, it's up to the full mark now. We don't have to put any more in. Now your oil change and oil and filter change is finished. As you can see, the distributor is aptly named as it distributes high tension current to each individual spark plug. Obviously the spark in each cylinder has to occur at the exact instant to enable complete burning of all the fuel in the cylinder. That's why ignition time is so important. Now we'll get on to tuning your engine. Using the correct plug spanner, take out all the spark plugs. Just place them all to one side and we'll check them later on. Once you've removed the plugs, you'll find it very easy to turn the engine over by hand. You'll find out why very shortly. On the front of the engine, there's a pulley, which is the crankshaft pulley. If you remember from our schematic of the ignition, we have to get the spark to fire at the optimum time. And the way this is done, on the front of the timing cover, you'll see a plate with 0, 10, 20 degrees. It may be different on your car, but it'll be there anyway. On this one, we've put a white paint mark at seven degrees before top dead center, which is the timing for this particular car. Check up on your specification sheet to see what the timing for your car should be. When you've marked this one, you have to turn the crankshaft pulley over you can do this by hand, this is why the plugs are out, until the nick on the pulley is in view. Then mark that with some white paint. That way it will be a lot easier to see when we fix the timing light to the car to get the final ignition timing setting. Now we'll go to the distributor. This is the distributor. Now we'll just take the cap off. If you look carefully you'll see there's two clips on the cap. We'll just unclip them both sides and just move the cap to one side. Now we can see the rotor arm. Take the rotor arm off. And this is the cam. And underneath you'll see the ignition points. And they're the actual points there. Now you find on the cam there'll be four lobes on this particular car. It's because this is a four cylinder car. And each time one of these lobes rubs on the heel of the cam, you'll see the point open. As the points open, that's when the spark will occur in the cylinder. So obviously we've got to make sure 
that the points open at exactly the right time. That's why we put the timing marks on the front. But we also must make sure that they close for a certain amount of time to allow the voltage to build up in the HT coil. This is, this is governed by the points gap or the dwell angle, which are two particular ways of measuring it. And the way we do that for the points gap method, we move the lobe of the cam until the points are completely open. So I'll just turn the engine over. If you watch carefully, you'll see the points open. As you can see, the points are opening and closing. But I'll, we'll take these points off just to check them because they look slightly pitted. Now the way to remove the points, if you look carefully, you'll see a holding down screw there, which holds the back of the points on, and a holding down screw there. And if we take both of those off, we can pull the points off of the actual back plate and check them physically. Be careful that uh, you don't drop these screws on the floor. They've got little washers in, which would be the devil's own job to find. There's just two of them to take off. And remembering back to the schematic, we have got a wire connected to the points. But uh, it's a simple job to unclip that and take it out. Now, as you can see, the points are off, but there is still the wire connecting it. And that's just held on by that screw in the centre. Now, if we could get our screwdriver, just slacken that screw. And then the wire will just, just pulls off. And we can just slip it onto the new points or these ones when we've reconditioned them. Now we'll just check the actual point surface. As you can see, these points have been cleaned up before and there is some deterioration just around there. So I think we'll fit a new pair. A new set of points can be fitted by going exactly the reverse operation of what we've just done. Then we'll reset the points gap and set the ignition timing. We fitted the new contact breaker points. Now we must set the gap. Now the points are fitted, we're going to have to set the gap. Just make sure that the heel of the points is on the highest part of the cam. That will mean that the points are the, as far open as they can possibly go. The way we adjust the points is with this little peg. We have put a screwdriver in there and just turn, you can see the points opening and closing. We'd also need a feeler gauge to set the points gap. The setting for this particular car is the 20 thou feeler gauge, as you can see it reads 20 there, or 0.5 of a millimetre. And this is the gap that we have to set the points to. So just put the gauge in between the points. And then using that little peg we were talking about before, just turn it down until you've taken all the rock out of the actual feeler gauge. That's a little bit tight, so we'll just open it up very slightly. It's just about right. When it's in that position, just nip up the screws. You don't have to go ever so tight with these things because they're not going to move at all. And just double check. Just a nice sliding fit. That's the gap set to 20 thou. Now we put the top on the, the cap on the distributor and the rotor arm. Just check the rotor arm. Make sure there's no cracks running across the top and that the pickup point is nice and clean. Push the rotor arm back on. Distributor cap. Check the inside of the cap. The pickup in the middle is spring loaded little carbon brush, just make sure that's in good condition and there's no play. And just check around the distributor itself. Any cracks or anything you can see will probably mean that you get a misfire and need to put a new distributor cap on. So make sure it's all perfectly clean. Just put the cap back on. Press both clips up. Make sure the cap's nice and firm. 
Now we'll gap our new sparking plugs and fit them to the engine. Let's compare one of the old plugs with one of the new plugs. For this particular car, you will need two feelers to make up the required gap setting. The old plug, quite a big gap. That's due to wear taking place while it's been in the engine. For the new plug, which we've set to the right gap, as you can see, is a nice tight fit. We've got all the gaps set. Let's put the sparking plugs in the engine. Don't forget, when you do the spark plugs up, just do them up firmly by hand, and then do the last quarter of a turn up with the spanner. Don't do them too tight, otherwise you'll end up stripping the cylinder head. Let's put the cap back on. That's the plugs finished. Now we'll go over to the fuel filter and change that. If you have a fuel filter fitted, it's worth changing it at every service, because you find that a fuel filter will get blocked up and it will tend to stop the petrol flowing rather suddenly, and it's normally when you're miles from anywhere. Just undo the two clamps that hold the fuel pipes to the filter. Pull the hoses off. As you can see, that's just held into the body by a little clip. Fit the new filter. Tighten up the clamp, and that's all that's necessary to put a filter, on, a fuel filter, on these vehicles. Now we'll go over to the air filter and change that. To change the air filter, we need to take the cap off the top of the air filter housing. Just undo the wing nut, take it right off, take the cap off. There you can see the filter. You may have to just prise it up because they tend to get a bit stuck on the bottom. As you can see, compared to the new filter, the old one is very, very dirty and grubby. So we'll discard this and fit a new filter to this particular engine. Just make sure the filter goes down firmly in the housing. Put the filter housing cap back on. Wing nut. Stir it up pretty firmly because you want to keep all the dust out of the engine. And once you've got the wing nut right down, just squeeze the outside of the filter to make sure it's firmly home. Now that completes all we can do to the engine other than the final tune, which is the ignition timing. And we'll go on with that next. Let's now look at some of the things we need to reset the timing to the original mark. First thing, is a power timing light. These can be purchased reasonably cheaply at any motor accessory shop. Just follow the instructions for connecting it up and it will make the job of timing your car a lot, lot easier. Two other things we must do. This is the vacuum distributor line. It comes from the inlet manifold to the diaphragm on the distributor. We need to block that off so we don't get false and spurious readings on the ignition timing marks. So just pull it off and with a screwdriver or a bolt or anything just block the end up so that it can't suck air into the engine. And also undo the distributor clamp bolt. This allows you to move the distributor from side to side. This will advance and retard the ignition. Now as you can see by shining the timing light at the timing mark on the flywheel and the timing mark on the timing cover and moving the distributor, we can get the vehicle to advance or retard as much as we like. But what we want to do is get the two timing points coinciding. So we'll just bring the distributor slowly round until they're in line and then just nip that up with the spanner and the timing mark will be set. One thing we have left to do now is reconnect the vacuum pipe to the distributor and then we'll check the timing again and set the final idle speed. As you can see, we've reconnected the vacuum advance pipe to the distributor. Now to set the final engine idle speed, we'll have to adjust the throttle stop screw. 
which is this screw here on the side of the carburetor body. As you can see, it works on the cross shaft linkage, which operates when the throttle pedal is moved. By screwing this screw in and out, you can get the engine to go faster or slower. If your car hasn't got a tachometer, then you'll have to connect up a dwell meter, which is a, a, a thing you can buy at any decent accessory shop. It's very cheap. Just connect it up and you can set the final idle as per the manufacturer's instructions. Just remember, when you set the engine final idle to the manufacturer's specifications, just use your timing light to check the timing hasn't moved. The timing is still in exactly the same place. Your engine is now tuned. We'll now check the positive crankcase ventilation system. Fresh air is drawn from the air filter into the engine through this pipe. And it's drawn back out of the engine through this pipe and burnt in the manifold. There's only one thing to check here. That's that this valve will only pass air one way. So if we start the engine, put your finger over the end and you should feel a very strong vacuum. If there's no vacuum evident, it means that, that the unit is unserviceable and you'll have to replace the valve with a new one. Now we'll go to the carbon canister. This is the carbon canister. It draws, takes the fumes from the petrol tank when the car is stationary, stores them in an activated charcoal interior. When the engine started, the fumes are drawn off and burnt. It's a non-serviceable unit, so if there's any signs of any damage, cracks, corrosion or anything like that, you'll have to change the whole unit. One of the last things to check under the bonnet, just make sure that the fan belt isn't too tight or too loose. It should have about 10 millimetres deflection in the centre of the belt. If it is too loose, it's just a matter of loosening up the alternator, pulling it over on the slide control and tightening it up again. One of the final things to do on your service, make sure your car's up safely on axle stands and just check the steering linkages. This linkage is the bottom wishbone linkage. Uh, this is the bottom ball joint. Just get a pry bar, put it in and just give it a pull. See if there's any play in them at all. There shouldn't be anything there. If there is, you'll have to look further into it. While we're in this area, as this is a front wheel drive car, there's rubber concertina boots over the constant velocity joints. Just spin the wheels both sides and make sure there's no tears or anything in the rubber. Check the exhaust system. Make sure it's firm and there are no holes or leaks in it. Just have a general look underneath the car to make sure that there's nothing out of place. Any fresh oil leaks or water leaks you'll be able to pick up very easily. Everything's okay in the front end of this car. So now we go and check the back end. Another thing to check while we're going underneath the car, just check your tyre wear. Just make sure that they're wearing evenly all the way across and there's no signs of any chopping on the tyre. If you notice any abnormal tyre wear at all, take your car into the nearest wheel alignment place and get the wheels aligned. It costs you about $30, but you'll more than save that in the price you save on tyres. Now we'll have a look at the rear suspension. This is the rear suspension arm. Just check the flexible brake hoses. Make sure there's no cracks in them. Get the, your pry bar and just make sure that there's no excessive play in any of the suspension mounts. And while we're under here, just check your shock absorbers. If there's any signs of oil leakage around the shock absorbers themselves, it means they're unserviceable and you'll have to buy a new one. While we're under the back of the vehicle, just check all the handbrake cables. Make sure there's no parts of them frayed at all. And how the exhaust system is. That's a very good system there, nice and firm. No corrosion evident. And just get a bit of grease and put over the ends of the handbrake cables so that they don't start corroding. Now to adjust the handbrake, this is the portion we use. By screwing this metal piece further up onto this cable, 
we take up the free play in the handbrake. And what we're really aiming for is a handbrake level which will come up four or five clicks. So just keep a general eye underneath the car to make sure nothing is frayed and nothing's falling off. The final thing to check whilst you're under the car is the gearbox oil level. This is the gearbox oil level plug here. Just put a socket spanner in it, crack it open, and just take the plug out. Now this is at the actual level hole here, so by just placing your finger inside, you should get oil on your finger as soon as it goes inside of the hole. And there's the oil level in this is perfectly okay. So we can just put the plug back in and nip it up tight. And that's the oil level check. Now if we wanted to drain the oil, we'd just take the plug out of the bottom of the vehicle, let the oil drain out, put the plug back in and fill it with fresh gearbox oil. And when you put these plugs back in, because they're a tapered plug, they don't have to be done up ever so tight. Just nip them up firmly. People tend to do these up too tight and end up cracking things. gearbox finished. You've now completed your service. Just look, let's look at a few things that will make for safer, happier motoring. Once a week, get somebody to sit in the car, check the front lights, headlights, high and low beam, and the parking lights. Also go around the back of the vehicle and check and make sure that the stop lights and indicators are working at the back as well. Just check the windscreen wipers. Make sure the rubbers are in good condition. Go inside the car. Make sure nothing is loose, the steering wheel's tight. The seats are still firmly bolted to the floor. No frays in any of the seat belts. Just take time every time you go out in the car to make sure there's nothing loose. And you'll have many miles of safe, happy motoring. <laughs>